You guys ready? All righty. So, like, I totally understand. Like, this talk is kind of ridiculous. If you want to go check out a more technical talk, I'll talk about what we're going to learn in today's talk. But I like to start off with a story. Uh, in honor of my dad, uh, I want to tell a really funny story. Uh, my dad's into rock and roll music, right? And it, when I was 13, I was really into to hip hop. And particularly this album, well, I happened to uh, overwrite like a tape. I don't know if everyone remembers like a set tape. Uh, so I happened to like overwrite and it was mostly Eric Clapton, but when it got to the end, it was that particular NWA album. So here my dad is, right, listening to Eric Clapton in his BMW 535i, right, cruising down the street and the NWA album comes on. And I, you know, he confronted me about it and was actually laughing about it because I'm like, oh man, like I'm in trouble because like I used to have to like hide the explicit lyrics and all the music that I listened to from my parents. But he was totally, uh, totally cool about it. We had a good laugh. And if you think about some of the language on those tracks, you can imagine uh, my dad's reaction to that. Uh, some young punk then totaled that, that car a few years later. Uh, oops. So uh, the goals for this talk. Again, thanks everyone for coming. So the goal is one, we're going to have fun, right? Um, and I think when I ended up like with the final versions of this talk, I was like, it's really about being a better person in security. And like, what a better venue to give that at than DerbyCon. So uh, each of the sections has three lessons, right? It's the hip hop lesson, a little bit about hip hop. It's a little bit about the security lesson. And the final part is the life lesson. And thank you so much, Dave. Now I'm belching during my talk. Uh, so. The last part is the life lesson. I call that the song I was playing earlier, Check the Technique, Gangstar, right? So when I say check the technique, you're going to say, see if you can follow it. So, check the technique. See if you can follow it. Now, this is a sequel to my Kung Fu talk, right? Everything I learned about security, I learned watching Kung Fu movies. This is a sequel. Set your expectations accordingly. <laughs> All right. Now, when I give this talk, the most popular question that I get is, like, Paul, how do you come to love hip-hop so much? I'm like, well, the first thing is, my parents didn't want me listening to it, right? I don't know how many people can recognize that album right there, but I had to hide that album from my parents, right? Especially the cover. And the fact that they didn't want me listening to it just made me want to listen to it more. The second thing was, I lived in a really boring neighborhood in Rhode Island, right? It is like the whitest suburb on the planet. And... Things were pretty boring, right? And But when we listened to the hip-hop, especially from the 90s, wow, it was just fascinating how different it was from the lifestyle that I was living. And that's what kept us interested, I think, is one of the main things. I mean, can you imagine if hip-hop music was about, like, white suburbia? Like, what would they be rapping about? Like, I went to school today, and then I went to lacrosse practice, and then I did my homework. Like, yeah. <laughs> You can, you can continue that, that joke in the bar tonight and, and have a lot of fun with it. All right, the third, music, uh, third reason why I love hip-hop so much, I liked it when I was, when I was really young, uh, like 8, nine, ten years old. I was listening to Run DMC, LL Cool J, and I was really influenced by the movie Beat Street. Those of you that may have watched it back in the day, I'm not sure how it would hold up to, to today watching it, but that was like one of my favorite movies growing up. Um, I think the other the fourth reason why I really appreciate especially hip-hop music today is to hear a true master at his or her craft, right? I mean, when you listen to some of the tracks that I put together, because yes, there's a website and, and a hashtag uh, and multiple Spotify playlists for this talk. Sometimes I think I go overboard for this talk, but it was so much fun and I had so much to capture. So there is an eight-hour playlist, uh, roughly. <laughs> So it's like an all-day thing. You're going to be immersed in this talk all day. When I worked on this talk, I listened to that playlist, and I chose tracks, specifically ones that I like that influenced me in some way or bring me back to a time earlier in my life that uh, when I was listening to hip-hop music. So you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash hip-hop. Don't go there now. The slides are there. Like, just pay attention. Go there later. There's all kinds of references materials, including this really awesome playlist of my favorite hip-hop tracks of all time that really make me feel the energy and make me appreciate the true masters of their craft, uh, which I think is another reason why I love it. All right, so now we're gonna delve into, get, get it? Yeah, I, I was expecting laughter, putting five, ca 
All right, that's how it's going to be. I get it. I get it. So some people say hip-hop was a fad. Now those younger folk in the audience are like, what are you talking about, Paul? Hip-hop is a fad. No, back in the day, everyone was saying hip-hop was just a fad. It was going to come and go and be gone. Some people say that about security as well, right? Um, so I, I just want people to realize that like, when I tell this to my, some of my employees that are a lot younger, like I look at when they were born on their birthdays and, and I was in, in high school, and I'm like, thanks, now I feel old. They didn't realize that this was a thing, that controversy around hip-hop music, um, not just it being a fad, but also the controversy about explicit lyrics. Like Those were things back in the day. People were mad that they were using curse words and talking the way they did in hip-hop music. Um, and I think one of the ways they wanted to get rid of it was to call it a fad. Obviously, you know, it's here to stay, which is awesome. Although we'll talk about some of the newer rap <coughs> today. Excuse me, where that came from. Uh, so a lot of people like to declare something dead, right? Young people. Now, wh what I found in my research, and I thought this was great, like hip-hop music crosses all ethnicities, gender, race, social, economic status, right? And I, I think security does the same thing. I think there's a lot of reasons why it appeals to both. I think the major thing in security is it affects everyone, right? The security that we talk about in our industry today, uh, there's no one that is not affected by it, right? I mean, maybe people that have zero internet you know, connection in, in remote countries, perhaps, um, but there's still, most of the people in the world are affected by the security issues that we're collectively working on as a community. And I thought that that was really a good parallel to hip hop. Of course, some people also like to declare things dead that aren't really dead, uh, like spam. But so when we get to the security side and we ask, what are some of the things that could be security fads or a security itself a fad? The first one that I hear all the time are people talking about how the CISO or CISO role in an organization is really just a fad. Like this is something that's just gonna be integrated into the business. Now I know many of you sitting there work for large financial companies and you just like try and picture your organization without a senior executive role that's focused on security. I don't know about you, but I don't really see that happening. I think there will be some changes to the CISO role, um, but I think you know people right now think it's a fad. I don't think it is. We also see development and operations, right? So software development and IT operations and security People say, well, security has no role, it's just gonna be baked in. I think, I, I think that's wrong as well, to give you a, a hint on the next slide. Now, applications and infrastructure will move to the cloud and will eliminate the need for operational security because it's in the cloud. I, I've heard that too, like, oh, we're not gonna need security people because we can just can put things in the cloud. We're not rack and stack and hardware anymore. It's just a configuration in the cloud. Now, obviously, I don't buy into all those things and I think people really fear change. Um, and while they don't, they don't want to see those th roles change, I think the CISO role needs to be there to balance risk, immaturity, and apply to the business. We just did a great interview with a CISO, um, <clears throat> Jason Albuquerque, whose role as CISO is directly aligned with their business, which is awesome that we've progressed this far. I think security will lead threat modeling and incident response for a lot of things that happen with your applications. We need that security role. Sure, we may have security champions. We still need the security role to at least be looking in the future. Like if you've nailed operations and security, like good for you, you still need someone dedicated to security to look into the future and see what may pose a threat and build that in before it becomes a problem. Also, security controls have just moved to the cloud. I mean, this is the same thing, but just different. The controls that we put in place on physical systems just look different in the cloud. So I don't see that role going away as a security engineer or security architect. I see it just transitioning into the cloud and being different. All right, check the technique. All right, I, I, did you forget what the line was? That's hilarious. <laughs> you need to listen to more Gangsta, all right? See if you can follow it. So let's check the technique. Yes, fads come and go, but helping people last for a really long time. This was great advice that was given to me by none other than Ed Scotus really early on. I said, Ed, what, what, what can I do to, um, you know, not just help people, but I'm like, I want to have a, a business. I want to grow with the security community and stand up a business. He said, Paul, the best thing you can do is help people. So I started the podcast and uh, really glad that I did. I'm really glad that, that all of you listen. So... Uh, 
Number two, rap songs uh, are rarely original. Many of you know this. I didn't know how deep the rabbit hole went. Uh, I also have a security story as well. My original thought for security story was the concept of a firewall. However, if you've looked into trying to unravel just who created the firewall and what role they played, it is a hot mess. Um, you know, however, Cheswick Bellavin, uh, who you can see here, as well as Paul Vixie, all played a role. Marcus Radom, of course, played a role as well. It's not a very good example. Sometimes you might think it, it is, but it really isn't. Now, in hip hop, we have many different uh, samples that have happened over time, um, such as this one, which now, just hearing the first beat, everyone knows the song, right? What's the song? Yell it out. <laughs> this is actually called The Edge by David McCallum, right? This was the original. Um, it was, of course, sampled by Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. And this is the next episode, right? I mean, listen. It's exactly the same, right? I mean, they put their own spin and flair on it, right? But it's the same thing. Um... Some of you may recognize this song, right? What song is that? Cash rules everything around me. Except you're wrong, right? This is As Long As I've Got You by the Charmels. How about that? Of course, we all know the original, or at least we should. Cash rules everything around me. I mean, direct copy, right? They put their own spin on it, of course. Uh, and those are just a couple of examples. Now, when uh, we get back to it, and the, there's YouTube videos in, embedded in there, uh, but I'm not connecting it to the internet with all you people around. Uh, so some of my other favorite samples, thanks to Kevin Finisterre pointing out the Amen break. Now, what the Amen break is basically a little-known B-side in 1969 ended up embedding itself a riff from that song or beat from that song in over 1,500 modern-day tracks. It's one of the most sampled beats or breaks uh, that exist in music today. It's called the Amen Break. Now, what the question that Kevin posed to me earlier was, Paul, what's the equivalent in security? And I'm like, I, I, I don't know yet. I'll update the website once I figure that out. I want to pose the question to the group. I don't know what the equivalent is in security. I do know, however, that nothing, not nothing, but few things in our industry today are truly unique. Over dinner last night, now I had already created this slide like weeks ago. Over dinner last night, I turned to John Strand and I said, John, what's the earliest example of threat hunting that you could find? I mean, without hesitation, John goes, well, it's the cuckoo's egg, Clifford Stahl. I'm like, thank God that we're in agreement about that because I already built a slide and I hate to have to go back and change it now. I mean, his supervisor asked him to look into a 75 cent accounting error to go investigate someone who had already compromised or abused something. That's the fundamental and foundation for threat hunting that we call it today, which is a term that didn't really become used in our industry until maybe five years ago. Maybe five years ago is where I can trace it back. Now, if I go back to what I was doing working for a university in 2005, I actually published an article, which was then Security Focus, which was acquired by Symantec, on IP audit. And I was analyzing NetFlow data to guess what? Look for machines that were already compromised. Now, I didn't call it threat hunting, but when I went back and read my article, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much like threat hunting as we call it today. I'm not saying I invented it. I'm saying it was something I, I was doing that later became a thing in our industry, proving the point that you know, nothing is truly original. Um, now, what's interesting is today, we've got all kinds of tools for threat hunting. Many of them are open source, Security Onion, Bro, Elk, uh, Yara, and a whole lot more. There's open source resources. There's tutorials on how to do it. Now, when John and I sat down, I said, John, you know, it'd be really cool like, if I had a threat hunting tool that automated what I was doing back in 2003 to 2005 in the university because I didn't have all these fancy tools. I'm like, we really need something that's like, you know, open source and lets people do threat hunting. He's like, oh yeah, we, we created Rita. He's like, it's free, it's open source, and it lets you do threat hunting. So I included it on that slide because it is completely free and open source. Um, so we've progressed from that point of 
manually investigating uh, things that happened over telephone lines to uh, using uh, NetFlow tools that are very much a manual process to now, I mean, there's tons of free tools, uh, including one created by John's team. Now, check the technique. Yes. Don't worry about doing something no one else is doing. And I think we really get hung up on this, um, that we have to do something truly unique. Truly unique things are very, very rare, not just in our industry, but in other facets of life in other industries as well. Do something and make it your own. Um, I mean, I'm not the only security podcast, but I do it and I make it my own and we make it work, right? If you read the book called Play Bigger, right, they talk about how people created new categories and did new things. They were largely based on other things, but they put their own spin on it. Salesforce was just another CRM, but they said, we're going to do it in the cloud. And, that, and they did, and they became the category king. So don't worry about being unique in the projects that you take on or the things that you do in your career. Worry about making it your own. All right. True security or hip hop experts are also kind of rare, right? If uh, you watch the HBO series, The Defiant Ones, um, and you watch Dr. Dre on like behind the mixer, I mean his muscle memory and the way he produces and, and uses the mixer, you can tell that that is a true master at his craft. Now, Dr. Dre will come up again, um, but I think he's the best example of a true master at his trade. This was uh, at his trade. This is a great uh, documentary, by the way, and I'm going to update the website with the movies that and documentaries I watched that I thought were really cool about this topic. And this one's about Dre and, and, and Jimmy Iovini, uh, which is really cool. Now, when I flipped to security, and I had to think of an example of interviewing or sitting down with a true master, I don't know if you've watched the Leonard Rose interview. I took from that that he would, did I, everyone like agree, like, I'm not talking out of turn, right? Like he's a true master, the things he talked about doing, his career, largely under the limelight. No one had like heard of Leonard Rose other than he got in trouble with the law and he's in Wikipedia, right? But when he came on and told his story and talked about the things he's doing, tens of thousands of hosts automatically deployed with OSM, I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Uh, so, you know, that's my pick for total security ninja that we've interviewed certainly recently, but what, who's your ninja in your organization? And we talk about this on the show a lot. A lot of organizations have those one or two ninjas, right? And they can vary in shape and size organizations, but typically you've got that one person. If you've read the Phoenix Project, you know that person's Brent, right? So when we have the Brents in the organization, how do we enable them to be the most effective given that they're so rare, right? I mean, a lot of us, that started that are old like me, I mean, it was before security positions were even like a thing. And now we're still working in security. Um, and how do we operationalize it? How do we allow them to pass some of their trade craft into an operational process? I think it's awesome that we've progressed as an industry that we're even talking about this, about how do we operationalize it? One thing that I'm noticing in the security industry is a lot more vendors now, right, wrong, or indifferent. Some actually do it, and as you know, like some don't, it's always a, a mixture, right? But the ones that can actually accomplish it are working towards what they call operational efficiency. And that's being able to take a product and have the expert do the implementation and evaluation, but have them pass a process off to the help desk, to IT operations, to your junior SOC analysts, and allow them to be effective, right? That's super important and something, again, like, like asterisk there, I see a lot of vendors messaging on it. Uh, only a few can actually accomplish it and deciphering between the two uh, is always difficult for me uh, and I'm sure many of you as well. Now, check the technique. Yes, you're getting better at that. Uh, so even experts have weaknesses, right? You might be the Brent in your organization, but it's important to recognize your own weaknesses and in my position where I grew into Security Weekly, I, I had an idea what some of my weaknesses are, and I specifically hired people. On your own teams, you can partner with people and work as a team to overcome each other's areas. We all can't be good at everything, right? Like, I suck, like, organizationally and trying to keep tabs on everything that's happening at Security Weekly and all the interviews we do. I knew that I would need people on my team that could help me manage all of that because that just wasn't my area of expertise. Um, I think it's important, and one thing someone told me very, very early on in my career, is to always try and teach yourself out of a job. I was kind of amazed that some people didn't have the same mentality. 
And when you teach someone your job, that allows you to go on and do other things. It also shows the leadership of the organization that you're able to teach other people and be a leader yourself. That is some of the best career advice that I ever got. All right. Security or hip hop legends aren't always either rapping or coding. It's like the nerdiest slide titles, but you're, you're following it, right? Uh, so, I mean, basically it means uh, we're going to go back to the Dr. Dre example because I think it's, it still is the best example. I mean, Dr. Dre, as you heard in the late 80s, actually, was behind the microphone, right? And as his career progressed, he says it in the documentary, he said, I never thought of myself as the greatest rapper. I thought of myself as the greatest person behind the mixer and producing. And that's the role that he grew himself into, leaving behind largely the mic. In fact, I think he just came out with an announcement and said, like, yeah, I'm done making albums. Because he realized that what he wanted to do and his dream and what he was good at was behind the mixer, right? Um, there's a great example of this in security today. And I think Doug Song is a shining example of how this happened. Many of us know Doug. I mean, how many people used D-Sniff back in the day, right? Like, that was awesome. D-Sniff was really, really cool. Doug was presenting at technical Usenix conferences in 2000. You fast forward to today, right? He founded Duo somewhere along there, had a stellar career, but maintained his CEO role at Duo Security all the way through selling to Cisco Systems for $2.35 billion. It's one of the highest value acquisitions in our space. Not only is that amazing, it's amazing to me that Doug started out in a technical role and maintained that CEO founder role all the way through. You imagine the logistics behind a $2.35 billion acquisition and what Doug was responsible for in his company. I think that's inspirational for all of us to know that we're not pigeonholed into a role, right? If we can see this transition, right? I, and I've reached out to Doug and I, I hope to bring him on the show specifically to talk about this journey so that uh, he can inspire the rest of us to make similar transitions. So, check the technique. That's right. Recognize when it's time to pass the torch, right? Now, now Doug maintained that role, but certainly that's not, that's like the unicorn case, right? What we see is people passing the torch to other people. That doesn't mean you can't still stay engaged technically. Maybe it's a less of a scale. Maybe you want to be technical and stay technical. That's okay. But your technical role or focus changes, right? You've gotten so good that you pass off what you're doing so that you can go focus on different technical projects. So don't think that you're stuck in a role, right? There's always a way to mold and shape your career. All right, not all hip hop or security legends are the most successful or even stay in security and or hip hop. Now, I, I like Too Short. I've always liked his music a lot. I don't feel like he gained the commercial success of other people that were in the same genre, in the same physical proximity uh, at the time, right? I, you might argue with me, but I would have liked to see Too Short gain more success and popularity than he did. I mean, he had some platinum albums, don't get me wrong. Uh, not too shabby, but... Uh, that was kind of my example there. Now, when we look into talented individuals in hip-hop, I mean, they've had their struggles, right? Uh, if you've watched the new movie on the documentary of Tupac, who apparently that picture was taken yesterday, because if you saw the news, he's still alive and, and living in Malaysia, I think is, was, was the report. In case you're wondering, so he is still alive. Um, but he had a lot of legal troubles. He couldn't break away from... Uh, Death Row Records, right? There's a quote in the movie, he's like, you know, I'm not Dre. He's like, I, I gotta stay here because of my debt, because of all the legal stuff that happened. Um, now, after the fact, of course, you know, his death and his estate has been very profitable. But at the time, the movie shows there were struggles there. Of course, you know, we know the story behind MC Hammer. He was, he was huge in debt as well. Now, when I got to thinking about, and I'm not saying these people are not successful. They are successful in their own right. My wish is that these people who were inspirational to me to work in security, I read the cuckoo's egg and I was like, I want to, I want to be a hacker. I want to work in security. That is awesome, right? And so I read Clifford Stahl's book, The Cuckoo's Egg, and I was disappointed that he didn't further a career in InfoSec, right? He went in different directions. Um, and, and, you know, today, uh, this is what he's working on is selling, you know, bottles and, and, 
pursue your dream. I'm not knocking him for that. If that's what he wants to do, that's awesome. Again, it's my wish. The same thing with Robert T. Morris, right? Created the first computer room in 1998. If you take any security curriculum today, likely you're going to be talking about the Morris worm and studying the Morris worm. I did that early in my career, and I'm like, this Robert T. Morris guy must be awesome. Like, what's he doing today? I mean, he's done really well for himself, and that's awesome, and I acknowledge his accomplishments through and through. I just selfishly wanted to see them stay in security. All right, check the technique. So the goal here is to, the lesson here is to follow your dreams. Now, how many people have read the last lecture by Randy Pausch? Okay, if you haven't read that book, make sure you go read it. It's awesome. Uh, if you haven't figured it out by now, this is not my last lecture, but if I were to give a last lecture, it'd probably have a lot of the lessons that I had in this presentation, and I drew inspiration from Randy, uh, who I just thought was awesome. So, I mean, it, my dream is to stay in InfoSec, your dream might be too, but you know, you follow your other, your dreams, even if that means disappointing people like, like me or disappointing someone, that you're not in the role that you, other people anticipated you to be in, right? Follow your own dreams. All right. So why aren't there more female rappers or females in security? And you know, this was an interesting parallel because I always wondered that growing up as I was listening to rap music. I'm like, why aren't there more female rappers? Like, I don't get it. The ones I listened to I really love, Queen Latifah, MC Light, loved all of their work. Why aren't there more people or more female rappers? And when you make that parallel and go into our field, I thought long and hard about um, how, why there aren't more females in technology in general. Now, my, I've talked about this on the show. I've talked about this with lots of people. My whole thing is I like to start engineering at a younger age. Now, some people might disagree and say you shouldn't start programming uh, at a younger age. My stance is I, I think elementary school is a great time to learn programming. And so what I did was find resources. You probably have heard of Scratch. You might have heard of Tinker. These are both programming languages that you can start in elementary school. Code.org, one of the challenges that I had is, like, I I'm a kind of a sucky programmer. Like, yeah, I've done programming. Like, I don't look at myself as a software engineer. Like, there's a huge difference, right? But when I thought about how would I teach software, pro I'm like, how would I teach people how I code? Like, that would be horrible. They would pick up terrible bad habits. And I'm like, what's out there to teach people how to teach programming? It turns out it, it's code.org, as simple as that. And when I beta tested this presentation, people said, yes, that, that's a great website. Now, one you might not have heard before came from a research assistant from none other than Randy Pausch, who did research to create Alice.org, which is another framework for teaching young children and kids how to program. The thing about Alice is what I found interesting is that there is a research paper published by Ka Caitlin Keller, and Caitlin was a research assistant under Randy. And Randy and Caitlin spearheaded this Alice.org effort and published this paper to support it. Basically, what the research paper says, you can go read it for yourself, is that <clears throat> how their storytelling aspect of their Alice framework to teach programming was more appealing to middle school girls than when it was not a storytelling exercise. So when you check the technique, when you get back and teach, which is my challenge to you, to teach programming to kids in elementary school is to read that research paper and keep it in mind, right? I think that's finally some scientific evidence that I found that I think supports how we can engage more people in general, and in this case, women specifically or young girls to get into engineering and programming. Um, so use those resources, go forth and do it for free. Um, you know, when I get back, I'm going to put something together. There's a lot of students that I've found locally in my community that want to learn programming. So we're going to put together a free Python programming class for them. And so I just ask all of you to do the same thing. All right. Now, this one required a lot of thought. The most influential rappers and or hackers deviated from established norms. Now, if you read this kind of funny thing, uh, I, this person, the student who wrote this, I don't like the teacher's response, right? Because they asked, why do you think Hitler had so much power and influence over people? The student answered, Hitler had so much power and influence over people and countries because, now notice they repeated the question to fill up space, because they had all those lines to fill up, 
and they needed to fill something up. So they repeated the question and then said, because of his mustache. That's create, that is hacking right there. I had to fill some lines up and come up with an answer. Like, to me, this student, I'm like A plus. Uh, like, you're coming to work for me someday. That's awesome. So I got thinking about who's the most influential. Now, this was um, first presented to me by Dual Core on Facebook, made, posed this question. Who's the most influential rapper or rap song, right? And I'm looking at all the responses, and I agree with a lot of them. Don't get me wrong. But it was more based on personal taste or choice than it was thinking about who's the most influential. Who changed certain aspects of the industry, certain aspects of the social and economics of people in general through their music, right? Now, Rakim is a, an interesting example because I think largely changed the rap game, right? Like there was before and after Rakim is kind of how Snoop Dogg uh, lays it out, that that's the influence that Rakim played. I think the most influential is N.W.A., They didn't just change the rap game by introducing gangster rap. They challenged the notion of explicit lyrics, right? That, and challenged the notion of free speech and, and really stood up for free speech. They also raised awareness of police brutality and racism, which is an issue we still have today. As a society, they were doing that in the late 80s. They also created, they didn't, weren't the originators, right? There were inklings and, and little smidgens of gangster rap but they brought it to the masses through their first album, Straight Outta Compton. And so for that, the, to me, that's influence, right? Like, look at all those things that they were able to influence over time. When we start thinking about, so, like, who would be your most influential security person, myself included, don't, don't do that. I don't put myself anywhere near that list. Who was your most influential person in security? Masha was on my previous slide. She's awesome. She's awesome. Security awareness, her take in research is, is fantastic. Malware unicorn. unicorn. So I thought, and you can all think about who you think is your most influential and why, which I think is an interesting thing to think about. There you go. <laughs> Two women right away. That's awesome. So when I thought about who influenced our industry the most, my first uh, kind of, I don't know if there was a tie, but, you know, Gene Kim with DevOps. Now, Gene, when you dig into his books, The Phoenix Project and Beyond the Phoenix Project, you very quickly realize that Gene didn't create this concept that he put into those books, that he followed exactly the structure from Goldratt, who wrote The Goal, and then did the audio book Beyond the Goal. Gene did the same thing. However, while Gene may not have created the template and the framework, Gene brought DevOps into our security community, and I believe it's had the most impact on software security than any other project or initiative that's been out there and influenced our industry. I also think that maybe a tie for first place is HD Moore and bringing Metasploit. The level of awareness that that project has raised about vulnerabilities, exploits, about the way companies should treat and handle vulnerabilities and researchers was the most influential for me. Um, so those are people that I, I would put on my list. All right, check the technique. Challenge established method, methods even when it becomes difficult. The best, I think, entrepreneurs that I work with are taking on a lot in that they're trying to create a new category or challenge the way things are today, okay? And fail, failure is just one step closer to success because they don't always succeed in the beginning. Right, But if they keep at it and learn from their failures, um, they're off to really, truly create something great. Okay. How much time do I have left? 17 minutes. Thank you. Number eight, rappers or hackers are gone but not forgotten. Okay. Now, this, this is kind of, uh, I admittedly, I wanted to go back and listen to the interviews uh, with Barnaby Jack uh, and uh, Cedric Sid uh, Blancher. Um, you know, both uh, in Becky Bass as well. I I don't didn't know Becky personally, but on my Security Weekly team, everyone was very visibly uh, upset, and I respect her her research. However, you know, I wanted to go back and, and listen to those interviews, and I just haven't had a chance. But I'll link to them in the slides. So we can all go back and listen and hear what they had to say when they were with us. Right? That's really um, the, the the purpose of this section. 
uh, and they, you know, they all died tragically in their own uh, different ways. But I had the fortune uh, and was blessed to have interviewed them when they were still with us, uh, which is really cool. Uh, so you can find their audio. This was back when we were doing just audio. You can find their audio interviews uh, that I linked to in the slide. So everything that you see here is available on the website. So and all the links are clickable. Uh, so check the technique. Don't hesitate to introduce yourself to people because no one's here forever, right? Like, had I not taken the initiative to try and get Barnaby on the show, to try and get Cedric on the show, I'd be sitting here going. I really wish I could have interviewed them, right? And, and I'd have regrets. So, uh, you know, seize the moment. If there's something you want, you got to go after it. Um, I'm grateful, I said, that, you know, I have that opportunity. And it got me thinking about, like, what are you going to leave behind as part of your legacy as well? So, all righty. Number nine. Now, new hip-hop. <laughs> Every time I say that, it's something in my throat. <laughs> not always better, right? New is not always better. So new things like blockchain, I think really get um, a bad reputation. And I've had this conversation with a lot of people. And look, I'll give this to you. People are using blockchain as a bogus marketing term. I mean, if there's anyone that sees bogus marketing terms a lot in the course of his or her day, like that I see a lot of it. I mean, those of you that listen to Enterprise Security Weekly know that we call it out if you're going to use bogus marketing terms that mean nothing. I mean, we read this stuff all the time and go, hey, that sounds great. I have no idea what they're talking about, right? And oftentimes we hear from those companies that we talked about like that, and it's a mixed bag. Some of them are really upset, and other ones are like, hey, you misrepresented, or you know, we, I'm like, well, let's do a call and talk about it. And sometimes when we do that, they uh, are awesome. And I'm like, you need to come on the show. In fact, Distill Networks, uh, who we work with today, uh, that's exactly how it happened. Got their CTO and founder on the phone, and I'm like, holy crap, dude, like, you're awesome, and what you just described is awesome, and we want to work with you. So, I mean, coming back to blockchain, I was thinking, like all of you probably were, most of you were, that it's just a bogus marketing term. Sharon Goldberg came on Business Security Weekly, and first explain blockchain better than anyone I've ever heard explain blockchain for people that are dense about cryptography topics like me, and I could understand it. I'm like, that's awesome. Um, but what we also talked about and gained insight to is once we understood really how it works, and let's not forget, this is a complex topic, we can then start applying it to where it might be impactful in security. And there are areas such as in supply chains, such as in maintaining a log for authentication and authorization and not being able to revert back. So there are some really great use cases for blockchain in security, although we have to be careful because it is used as a buzz, buzz term, buzzword, but make sure you go watch Business Security Weekly number 96, uh, the interview with Sharon. It was not a paid interview. She has a startup in, um, in cryptocurrency or in, in blockchain technology, which is really cool. Uh, it's actually in cryptocurrency. Um, but she, she was awesome and great explanation. All right. Check the technique. Even though there may not be better, it may not be better on the surface, give new technology a chance. I think we as a community might be uh, a little kind of curmudgeon -y when new technology comes up. I mean, maybe because I'm old now. But even newer people in our field, when we hear new terms, I think we're very quick to like go out and poo-poo something. And we don't, at least I made this mistake with blockchain. I didn't fully understand the technology and its implementation implications before I started poo-pooing it. Don't do that. Um, give this a chance. And that's not to say that people aren't, I mean, how many times you did you, if you went to Black Hat, you heard machine learning and AI, right? Till everyone was blue in the face. That doesn't mean that 100% of that security industry is full of crap. It means maybe most people are, and we have to determine and highlight the ones that aren't full of crap. Okay. Number 10, hip-hop or security has its beefs and own lingo. I mean, we have, we have, we have beef. That was, that's kind of funny, I guess. Um, <laughs> and we all know about the famous hip-hop beefs, right? And lots of great movies and documentaries that really kind of was one of the inspirations, uh, you know, for this talk. Uh, I think two of my, 
you know, uh, rap battle tracks or hit him up by Tupac. I mean, that is probably the most visceral and raw. I mean, like F you and I F your wife. I was like, well, we're not playing around anymore, are we? <laughs> uh, and of course, No Vaseline by Ice Cube is one of the, you know, other visceral ones out there. There's been inklings of that in our community, and I really wanted to highlight things that happened in the security industry uh, that are along those lines as well. Um, this article was one of the most visceral articles I ever read in the security industry. I mean, the gloves came off. And uh, I, I actually uh, connected with the author, uh, and he wants to see my, my slide, so I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, but uh, it's all good. I think taking that bold stance um, was really interesting. And But like if you read it, it basically is Carbon Black telling Silence, like, oh, cute, you're growing up. I was like, wow, that's, that's bold. That's bold. Uh, but that happened. That's still published today. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. I don't know that I want to encourage it to happen more often. Um, I like the fact that it happens very infrequently because I, I think it could be a distraction. But it was one thing that I noticed after doing, you know, over 100 episodes of Enterprise Security Weekly and, and reviewing all of this, that we did have one, like, beef. And, I mean, this statement is pretty much pretty close to some of the lyrics in Hit Em Up. So um, it, it made for an interesting discussion. Um, I know that a lot of people had mixed feelings. I think some people wish it wasn't published because it was very confrontational. And, again, I don't want to see that be a theme either. I think it's better to, to work out your differences um, as in, when we check the technique, uh, empathy goes a long way to settle beefs, right? I think we are very quick to sometimes jump to conclusions. Um, I'm not sure all the things that were happening in you know, the endpoint vendor lane at the time, who was doing what. It was probably a misunderstanding that could have had a better outcome other than publishing you know, that article. Um, but I've learned a lot about empathy. And I think that uh, it's very different from sympathy. And if you haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, like before I did, I was like, well, those are the same thing, right? And then I learned through April Wright and Michael Santarcangelo that like there's different types of empathy and really digging into empathy. This can apply, I think, very well in your jobs today. And when you're going to sell security in your organization, uh, I'm working with an individual now who's a brand new CISO in a place that does not want security, right? And you know, your advice could be like, well, what technical things are you gonna try and implement? What tactics are you gonna use to implement security? The reason the empathy is in a security presentation is because I'm coaching him on using empathy, trying to understand other people's perspective, understand what they want. Uh, put yourself in those person's shoes, right? Goes a long way to getting security done in your organization. Okay, now, uh, also, check the technique. Realize most people have no idea what we're talking about. And I'm sure you've all experienced this, right? When you start dropping acronyms and stuff. And, you know, obviously hip-hop has its own lingo too. And sometimes when we use that lingo, people have no idea what we're talking about. But certainly when we use it in a security context, uh, people don't understand. And I think two things. One, I don't understand all the acronyms either. And I have to be not afraid to ask. If I'm on a call with a potential client, with a vendor, or I'm doing an analyst briefing, and they're talking about stuff that I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I, it's in everyone's best interest that I ask that, right? Um, also, you know, this doesn't mean that you can't stay technical and talk technical. However, what it means is that when you're a leader in your respective teams or organizations, that you have to make sure that everyone understands the mission. And if you're using terms and lingo that everyone doesn't understand, whoever's working with you might not understand the mission, and that's really bad. Also, they should understand why. And again, if you're being very you know, too, too complex or not simple enough or using other acronyms, they may not understand why. And that's a perfect storm for really bad things to happen. Um, the great book that I'm reading now is called Extreme Ownership, right? And that's one of the things that they talk about former Navy SEALs that were in battle and also have been consultants in businesses talk about making sure your team understands the mission and understands why. Using a lot of acronyms and complicated terms in the wrong setting can lead to that, uh, that misunderstanding. Okay, I had to put that in there because, well, fuck him. 
<laughs> All right. That concludes this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Episode, what was it, 59 of Business Security Weekly. That's my explanation. Any questions? Oh, so the website has tons of stuff on it, um, including some of the articles that I read in preparation for this talk. Um, all the slides are there with all the links to everything in this talk. Um, there's multiple Spotify uh, playlists on there. Uh, one is the, the really long eight-hour one that inspired the talk. The other is another eight hour one that's a playlist that's based on that playlist that's another eight hours. And then there's the playlist that I use during the talk and then there is playlists from other people. One specifically that really influences talk is it's the original track and then it's the hip hop track, right? In, in order. So it's really cool to, and it, that playlist is like 10 hours or 14 hours and it goes through the whole progression. There's articles, uh, Rolling Stone article on NWA was just awesome. There's one that looks at the vernacular in hip hop uh, and most used terms and least used terms that I thought was really, really cool. Um, there's a YouTube video uh, from someone that wrote an article for Vox that talks about why certain rappers like Eminem and Biggie and others, like why they're different and why their tracks were so prolific and talking about rhythm and flow and, and tempo and really breaking it down at a technical level, um, which that, and all that stuff is really cool. Uh, I will be updating the, the site with all the documentaries and films that were associated with this talk as well because I just I thought it was awesome. I had so much fun uh, prepping for this talk and I hope everyone enjoyed it. So thank you. Kevin, you got a question. Pimpin' ain't easy. That was his question, is pimpin' easy. Hey, Trent, did you have a question or no? Oh, okay, what's up? <laughs>